Hey everybody, most welcome to the um, Realtors Chat. Um, this is another conversation that we'll be bringing you this evening. And if you're new here, please make sure you do uh, check out Amity Realtors, your number one real estate agency in Western Uganda. Hey, um, I see someone is already there. Hi, Derek. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, so guys, you're most welcome. As we get started, please just share the link on your timelines so we can have a number of people joining into the conversation. Uh, tonight on Amite Realtors Chats, we're going to be talking about the procedures and steps for management of property of a deceased person. Now, this week... If some of you guys watched NBS News, I think two days ago or maybe a day ago, um, there was a story which was being investigated and it has a lot to do with land issues and property issues. This time around, it's about a couple that was actually um, fighting to, to, to separate and also to share property. And there was a bit of foul play on on some side within their arrangements. So what ensued was someone is bound to lose property. Another one was actually struggling to get it. What usually causes that is that sometimes we don't know the right things to do. Sometimes we don't know. Uh, we don't even have an idea before we go into these dealings um, and some of these transactions that we do. So it's very, very important that you equip yourself with some bit of knowledge on some of these issues. So that is what we're going to be discussing today uh, with Council Alan, who will be joining us very, very, very shortly. Um, I just need to confirm, Doreen, I need to confirm if you guys can hear me. Uh, just give me an emoji. Just give me an emoji if you can hear me. Um, there is an emoji down there. I just want to make sure that my audio is very clear and you guys can hear me well. Um, and as soon as that is done, then I'm actually waiting on Council Alan to join in. And as soon as he joins in, then we will kickstart the conversation. But between and now, uh, between now and then, the hashtag is Amite Realtors Chats. Amite Realtors Chats is the hashtag. I was unable to include it in the conversation up there because uh, our topic is quite long, so the hashtag would not fit. Okay. Um, just to confirm, I think Doreen or uh, Derek, any of you guys that can hear me, please just just give me an emoji. There is, a, if you look down on your phone, there is a heart emoji. So please just go ahead and do let me know if you can hear me well. Uh, apart from that, I see Council Alan has already joined in. So just give me a minute as I connect to him and then we get started. And then we'll get started as soon as we have Council Allen. But like I was saying, guys, uh, this same week, I actually made a tweet after watching a story that has, um, you know, it combines, it's a love story, it's a love affair, love gone sour. Uh, and the story was on NBS News. It was being investigated. It had something to do with uh, a property, which was a home for the couple. And then also it has something to do with land, which was also land that was owned, um, so to say, as, as according to the investigation, it was owned by the gentleman. And later on, the wife took it on, the alleged wife. Um, this was a story between a foreigner and a Ugandan. And I think there was some bit of foul play on the side of, uh, from the side of the Ugandan who wanted the foreigner to lose property, according to the story. But my main gist here was land was involved and this foreigner was actually struggling so hard to find justice. Um, it looked like 
he didn't know what to do. It has taken him very, very many months, very many years uh, struggling to have uh, justice found. And that's why I was saying that this is why these conversations, the conversations that we always have here, many may take them for granted. Many may think that, hey, okay, today it's not about my land. Today it's not about our uh, family property. And you may take the conversations for granted, but... Someday, somewhere, you'll find this knowledge or these ideas very much applicable, especially if you're someone who is going to be buying property very soon, or if you're someone who is going to be investing in land very, very soon. So thank you very much, guys, for joining in. I am waiting for Council Allen. I see Council Allen has uh, already joined in. Uh, do me a favor, guys. Uh, just share this conversation on your timelines and invite more people to come and listen in. Council Allen, if you can hear me, I would love to, to know how you're doing. Uh, good evening, Gideon, man. I can hear you loud and clear. I am doing well. Oh, fantastic. Uh, your, your, net, your network is very, very superb tonight. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, uh, that is great. I think I should always work from home because today I'm working from home. So in case of fantastic. any noises that you may hear, please, you will forgive me. No, the network is very clear. We will forgive you for the noise. We have no problem. Um, so, Council, you found me uh, talking about a story that I watched about maybe two days ago or a day ago, um, which was very, very perturbing. Uh, but, of course, it included land as well and property. Um, a couple that, you know, fell out and things were going wrong. But before I go into that, uh, maybe just to know how has your week been since the last time we spoke and how is Mbara doing lately? Week has been okay. Uh, Mbara is good and uh, we are back to the dusk. The rain seems to have disappeared. But uh, one thing for sure the listeners must know is that uh, most of the aspects we talk about and discuss are not aspects that uh, affect a certain class of people. These are aspects that uh, affect us in our daily lives. But sometimes we may never know what the law says, what the law provides for. And uh, we need to agree that the law is a integral part of our lives, our daily lives, and we can't avoid it. So the more we know about the law, the better for us to avoid what we may see as normal situations every day, but uh, these are situations that really impact on us and uh, the lives of our people. Fantastic. Uh, Council, as we head into our conversation tonight, procedures and steps for management of property of a deceased person. Um, I would want to start from just maybe a little bit of the basics. Um, according to the law, who is a deceased person in Uganda and who is recognized as a deceased person? Maybe just to give it a bit of preamble as we head into the conversation. Uh, according to our law in Uganda, a deceased person is definitely somebody who has died. And uh, the only proof of death we have in Uganda is still uh, the death certificate, or if a death really happened quite a long time ago and we cannot have a death certificate, we have usually had photographs of the graves or remains, but the best proof is the death certificate. And uh, we have rare cases of uh, where somebody goes missing and uh, they have not been reported back. Such is given also a timeline within which such a person is going to be declared a dead person. Oh, fantastic. Um, and so also, uh, just as we, we get started, there is, there is something that um, has always confused people uh, as to whether property management starts as soon as the person is deceased or as soon as the person is buried. Because we've had scenarios where someone is still in a mortuary and there is always, you know, someone saying, oh, I'm the one in charge of this. Um, at what level does 
someone going to manage the property take over just um just for clarity because i had someone already ask that in a whatsapp group um as we get started and they told me maybe you need to ask counsel so that we are quite aware when someone should kick start um property management of the deceased uh when property management of the deceased takes effect uh depends on two circumstances number one it is going to depend on whether you die tested or to intestate. When we talk of tested, death or succession, these are circumstances where uh, the moment you die, you left a will. And when you left a will, you have given clear guidelines and instructions on how your property should be distributed and dealt with and then uh, after that, we shall look at uh, intestate succession. When you have died intestate, it is prudent to know that this is somebody who has died and has not left a will. So how estate management or property management of those two different people will take effect is totally different because if you have left a will, you have streamlined clearly. But ideally, once somebody has left a will, it is until it is read and then an executor takes out letters of probate. That is when the management of that will begin. Uh, so when we talk about management, it is not immediately because that is why we are here tonight to know the procedures and the steps for management of this property. So whoever does whatever they are doing, sometimes people do things in the the heat of the rush and uh, at times they end up making blunders. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so council, just from there, uh, I think you've already helped us understand um, tested and intestate succession. Um, I, I know there is the office of the administrator general. Um, would you take us through the role of the office of the administrator general? as regards today's conversation. Okay, uh, thank you, Yugaman. When we talk about the Administrator General, the Administrator General basically will come in up when somebody has died and tested and has not left a will. When somebody has died and tested and has not left a will, it means Administrator General, usually when uh, that uh, General issues a special guidance, uh, what we call a certificate of no objection, and uh, usually it is upon application. So once somebody has died, you are going to go make an application at the office of the administrator general and then you will be given a file where uh, you are going to be required to list, to list some details the names of the beneficiaries intended beneficiaries and here you are talking about the children of the deceased uh, any other dependent relatives the spouses then you list the properties all that of uh, the deceased person in the application that you make to the office of the Administrator General. Once you have done that, the Administrator General is going to issue a notice or a letter calling for a meeting of all the would-be beneficiaries, family members, and relatives of the estate of the deceased person. And this could be called by an officer of the Office of the Administrator General, or sometimes such power is uh, delegated to the district staff, and usually it is the Chief Administrative Officer to whom a letter will be written, and so many questions will be asked in that letter. But in other instances also, this Chief Administrative Officer also delegates that power to the sub-county chiefs. 
So you will find uh, that in some areas, especially outside Kampala, these meetings are conducted at the sub-county. Or in even more organized uh, communities, the chairman also will be involved and the family will sit. But then those minutes will have to go back through the chain up to uh, until they reach the office of the administrator general. So in this family meeting that you are going to conduct, you are going to list to number one, the properties of the deceased, the children of the deceased, uh, the spouses, and then tell us whether the deceased left a will or not. When you, are listed, when you are listing properties, you're going to include properties within and outside Uganda, those that you may know of. So once the administrator general gets this report and uh, they will then act on it, something else you'll have to include in this report is that as a family, you have sat down and given consent to one or two or three or four beneficiaries of the estate of the deceased person to be the ones given a certificate of no objection from the office of the administrator general. And then it is this certificate of no objection that these one, two, or three or four people will use in court to obtain what we shall call letters of administration. So all that process is facilitated by the office of the administrator general. The office of the administrator general has uh, what we call now regional offices. We have a regional office in Fort Porto, Barara, uh, Lira, I think, and uh, Rua. I'm sure of Arua. I'm not sure about Gulu, but there are so many now. It is no longer Kampala alone. So those in Kampala can always approach the office, but those in the various regions, you'll be encouraged to go to the regions and uh, apply while there. So once you have done that and uh, filed a consent with the administrator general, then the administrator general will go ahead and uh, issue what we call that certificate of no objection, or in short, it is called the CONO in capital letters with a C. And then that will be the end of the administrator general in that estate. It will mean that he's no longer interested as mandated by law to take charge or administer such an estate. And uh, once he has done that, then whoever is given that certificate is free to go on and apply in court for a grant of letters of administration. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, that actually sheds a bit of light um, into my question that I want to ask you before we go on to the main question I wanted to ask. Um, does this process, for example, I'll just give you an example. Uh, maybe, you know, John or X has passed on and burial is supposed to happen. This process of engaging the office of the administrator general, does it necessarily have to be before burial takes place or it can all happen actually after burial has taken place? For example, for cultures where people don't show their hair or maybe the successor to the deceased immediately, can, can the family or can the, you know, the people in charge engage the administrator general after burial or these arrangements are supposed to be done and agreed on before burial of the deceased? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, given the heat and rush that happens uh, upon death of somebody, uh, we cannot surely say that this should happen. Uh, before the burial because it is a long process. It is a long process. It involves government offices and this is a process that could take you at least a month. So we cannot even encourage people to begin this process before somebody is buried. It is usually advisable that do the burial first, then you'll have a family meeting later. But also the key distinction we have to name here is that uh, when we talk of heirs and successors, we mean totally different people in law and in culture, because a cultural heir is not the same as the legal heir. A legal heir is the administrator or the executor who is going to see to it that after he succeeds you in law, this person takes your place in law. And uh, for us, we distinguish them between the cultural heir because sometimes people may say, yes, I want so-and-so, my son, my elder son, to be my heir. But for purposes of the law, 
I want so and so to be my administrator. So that is a legal heir as opposed to a customary heir. Uh, you might find that a legal heir may not even be your son or wife or relative. Could be an outsider who you believe and trust that uh, if this person succeeds me, he will surely manage my property and then distribute to my beneficiaries properly. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Council, for that. Now, um, talking about this entire process, because I know that many of us listening here may want to know, um, you, you've taken us through how we should be engaging the Administrator General and maybe the people that are given those powers. But now, I wanted to quite vividly um, get to know how long does the process take? And also, maybe just to give us, because you usually give us those key, key elements that we must take away from such a conversation that we should never, you know, skip in, in, in a process like this one. How, how long does it take? And what are those key things that you want us, the people listening to you, to make sure that whenever we get into this kind of state or this kind of procedure, we must ensure certain things happen, Council? Uh, thank you very much, Yugaman. Uh, number one, when we talk about time, one, the path you have taken, and then secondly, you as a family, you are, because like I've explained, the procedure that I gave first was in relation to somebody who has died and they did not leave a will. Their family will have to go through that process up to the stage of the Administrator General, that is where I stopped. But you realize that after getting the Kono or Certificate of No Objection, they will have to go now to court and file an application for letters of administration with either will annexed or without a will annexed. And uh, here, the maximum time, because you're going to have period within which to advertise this notice. When you file an application in court for grant of letters of administration, the court will issue a notice, which notice you are going to have to advertise for a minimum of 14 days. Within these 14 days, this notice must be advertised in a wide, in a newspaper of wide circulation. Uh, in some instances, now they are requiring that even the applicant's name rather photograph uh, be published in the newspapers because of the fraud that surrounds estates and uh, property management. So what usually happens is that uh, after those 14 days or whatever days the court has given you, you will come back to court and then you will be, we call it identification, you will be identified by the judicial officer in charge and then uh, check all your documents and then proceed to grant you that uh, certificate of uh, letters of administration. However, when somebody has uh, seen a notice and probably they have not been a process or part of the process of your family meetings throughout the Administrator General's office, or if they realize that uh, in your application you have actually omitted uh, probably a son or a daughter of the deceased who ought to be a beneficiary and uh, they think that you don't have justification to do that or you have even included property in the application you're making to court that did not belong to the deceased person. This person is entitled to lodge what we call a caveat on your application. In other words, to put a stoppage, to put a halt they will lodge an application, a caveat, and uh, they will lodge it with the court that uh, where you filed your application, and then they will be given time to come and explain why they have lodged the caveat. If they find that they have genuine reasons, then you will have to go to court and argue about that. But if you agree with that person and make a few amendments, then you will proceed and be granted the letters of administration or probate, whatever the kind you'll have applied for. Now, all that time, you may not <clears throat> sorry, have control over that, but uh, 
the process with the office of the administrator general can take uh, bare minimum should be a month because of the back and forth. But all this entirely depends on you as the family members, you as the beneficiaries. The more you disagree, the more your file is delayed. Because if you cannot reach an agreement in the first meeting, you are going to have an adjournment. It may not be the next day because such an officer is not handling only your family. There are numerous matters that they are always handling. So unless you agree as a family in the first meeting, then you can always keep having back and forth, back and forth meetings, and that will take more of your time. Uh, the other aspect our listeners need to tap into and know is that uh, the aspect of where somebody dies tested. Uh, this is where somebody has died and at burial or after burial, soon after their death, we discover that, look, uh, so-and-so died, but he had left a will, kept it with me, and here it is. That will will be read out to all the would-be or known beneficiaries of family members. Uh, practically, it is usually read out at uh, the burial, or rather after burial. After burial, the next day, family members, the close ones usually convene, and then if there is any such a will, it is read out. Uh, there are usually calls the moment somebody dies. People are always making calls saying, if you have any will, any document pertaining to the properties or from the deceased, please come forward. That is made usually generally as they are calling upon those also who are undated or who owed money to the deceased person. Uh, once that will is read at the, after the burial at the first family meeting, the question will be posed. Number one, does anybody object to this will? Number two, is there any other copy of this will? Number three, is there any other alternative will other than this? Now, if you have been following our chats here at uh, Amity, we had one where we advised on how to make a will and all those elements. It is here that now we are seeing the purpose. Because if you come out after somebody has died and you're reading a will, you remember one aspect we told you, make three copies. If you make three copies, all these three will appear on this day and they will be similar. This is when everybody will be like, okay, we do not have an objection. But the moment two copies come up or three copies come up and they're not similar, what will be a valid will here is the latest that you made unfortunately so that is that takes us back to the first lesson but uh once that will has been read and uh we are assuming nobody is objecting now in that will still if you remember our first lesson we shall have required you to name an executor this is now your legal heir where there is a will is called an executor and where there is no will it's called an administrator so that executor named in the will and where the family does not object will straight away go to court. Not the key difference here. And the take-home point for me and for our listeners here is that uh, when there is a will and an executor named and the will is not opposed, such executor moves directly straight away to court. They are not going to go through the hassle of the administrator general's office. No, they are excused from that. So they will go to court, then begin the normal process of application, include all the names of the would-be beneficiaries, dependent relatives, spouses, and all the known properties of the deceased person. So they got caught, apply. They're also given the same timeline within which to fight to advertise the notice in a newspaper of wide circulation. And then that process will also go on until the grant of the letters of probate. Uh, that is if there is no uh, objection from the family members. So speaking of timelines, I would basically give it between one to three months to conclude this process. Oh, fantastic. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen who are listening to us, this is, I think, our fifth or fourth conversation um, this year. And we have been having conversations every Tuesday. Um, 
for those of you that want to catch up with the conversations, for example, the one about the wheel, you can find that conversation on the YouTube channel of Amite Realtors. And this conversation is powered by Amite Realtors, a real estate agency in Western Uganda. Please do go support them, go check them out, go consult, and also go buy affordable properties within the towns and within the city in Imbara. Okay. And so there is there is this other, um, you know, we've always talked about the hustlers. You know, the last time I told, I told you about hustlers and um, there is that comment I made on a post, which was actually on NBS investigations desk. Um, I'm sure maybe you saw it somewhere, somehow. If you followed that story, there was a bit of people that were actually trying to create a bit of confusion between the property owners. But in this case, I want to ask you this question. So in case of a disagreement, or say fraud, what are the remedies when going through these procedures and steps so that someone can be able to manage legally the properties of the deceased, especially in circumstances where you find that family members are not agreeing to certain things, but also in circumstances where you find that there is you know, I'll call them thieves. They always love to involve themselves in such procedures, especially if the family is not very, very keen on some of these things. Uh, what are the remedies available in case someone is into this situation? Uh, thank you, Yukaman. Uh Once you have challenges in the management or in any of those procedures and steps that are being taken uh, the first remedy uh, is always to lodge a caveat that is if somebody has reached the level of an application in court so if somebody has reached the level of an application in court you've seen a newspaper advert please run and lodge what we call a caveat i may not go into the details of how it is lodged and how it is done but the simple basic is find a lawyer any lawyer will know the basics of lodging a caveat and they will guide you through. This caveat is aimed at helping you hold the process and exercise of granting letters of administration or letters of probate until your concern is raised. Let's say they have included land. I've given the examples above. If they have included wrong land or land that never belonged to the estate of the deceased, you go and lodge that caveat and you'll be given an opportunity to be heard. Now, the other uh, remedy is uh, to go, if, if you find that actually letters of administration or probate have already been granted to somebody who probably shouldn't have been the person to receive them, or this person granted these letters of administration or letters of probate is actually misusing them, uh, you can file uh, an application for revocation of uh, the letters of probate or letters of administration and that application still is filed in the very court that granted these letters of administration or letters of probate you file the application you will be asked the grounds on which you oppose the grant those usually are one uh, if there's mismanagement by the administrator or if this administrator actually wrongly acquired these letters of administration or fraudulently to so speak the new amendment of the succession act today has brought in another remedy and uh, it speaks of an arbitration instead of filing uh, a normal case in court you are requested to have the matter arbitrated you you file, you request court, you write court and say we are having challenges with the administrators you gave us and they are not helping us in administration of the state properly. They are probably uh, squandering or making improper use of the proceeds of the estate. Once you file or you make that request, it could be by formal letter, then the judicial officer who to whom you are making that application and we are assuming this is the court that made this grant, will call for a meeting and notify both parties and then you will have your matter uh, 
the normal word would be mediated, but it is an arbitration. Usually, this procedure uh, of arbitration is not available to all estates, but it's available in circumstances where there are more than one administrator in an estate. They probably don't agree about the procedure and steps of management in such an estate. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Uh, and and council, maybe at at some stage, um, in case everything has gone well, there are scenarios where uh, we know people who come up to say, like you've said, maybe the administrate uh, the administrator is not doing the job as as required, or maybe there are people that were left out and they, they need something to be adjusted. But just before we go um, into the next question, Council, what, what's the difference between, because we just want to draw some clarity. In our cultures and families, we have uh, what we call omukuza. Yeah, I, I don't know, uh, the person in charge of raising the children. And then we also have the administrators legally, those that have been given the power to, to, to take care of the estate of the deceased. So just to draw some clarity, does the person who is in charge of the children uh, of the deceased have any powers anywhere that are given to him legally? By, by, by law to also have say on how the administrator runs uh, the deceased's property. You got me confused, Jigaman. I think I lost you somewhere, but I heard you speak of Omukuza and then the administrator. Actually speaking, uh, literally, I have seen in many circumstances and cases that uh, the person named as Omkuza in the wills of many of our people is usually the one we refer to as the administrator because the Mukuza is given the responsibility of looking after these children and in some cases distributing the estate. And this is somebody who is not a beneficiary of that estate. And then this is also somebody who the deceased believed in and uh, knew that, uh, okay, this person will take care and be responsible for my estate or property and children. So if the family, uh, according to the will, and they're not opposing it, believe that that is the person who should go on and get letters of administration or letters of probate, it is the same person. It is usually the administrator and it's the mukuza. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Council. Then there is another comment here, maybe before we go to the next question. What's the limited number of people supposed to apply for or administer a particular estate? Uh, usually, there has not been a limit. There is no statutory limit, but uh, the practice I have seen, I think they have not gone beyond four. We, the officers usually make sure that if it's a maximum and it is a really contested estate, they shouldn't go beyond four. At least these four should be able to represent interests of all the beneficiaries of the estate. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, so Council, I, I wanted to ask this other question. In specificity, what are the roles of the administrators and executors? Uh, thank you. When we talk of the administrators and executors, once you have been given the grant by court, your number one role is uh, to ensure that if there is a will left by the deceased, you follow that will. If there is no will, your roles still are similar. Uh, generally, one is to ensure that you locate all properties of the deceased, and then having uh, realized all properties of the deceased, you're going to list them. These include bank accounts, the land, the land titles, 
identify them, put them on a list, but also look for and know all the debts of the deceased person, money he owed to people, have it known. Of course, you make a general call either through family meetings. Some people even go to the extent of making ready announcements or even publishing in the newspaper. So once you have realized those, uh, make sure you pay all those debts. That is your also as an administrator or executor. But also, whatever is remaining, distribute that estate amongst the beneficiaries. That is if that is uh, according to the will or if there's no will, and that is the law, distribute that estate. And then having done that, you will have to file what we call an inventory to court. You have to report back to court and inform court of uh, what you found, how you have distributed it. And uh, once you have filed an inventory to court, your role as an administrator is done. You cannot go ahead and uh, do anything else. Once you have filed an inventory, in respect of all the properties of the deceased, your role as an administrator is done. But uh, the other most important aspect, especially when we talk about land, is that uh, as an administrator, remember we have talked about you being the legal heir to the deceased person. Your number one role is going to be after getting uh, the letters of administration or letters of probate, all titles that were in the names of deceased, make sure you transfer them to your name. But when you transfer them to your name, you are going to be, uh, the, 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 the way the title will be written is going to be Ambrose Musasizi, administrator of the estate of the late so-and-so. And then they will also cite the, high, the court number that gave you that grant such that whoever is looking at that title after that entry has been made is going to know that, okay, the land does not belong to Ambrose Musas as a person, but it belongs to him as an administrator of somebody who died because that person is also going to be named. And then the, the detail will go ahead to show that, look, uh, I was granted these letters of administration pursuant to a court order the court order is also going to be cited in there such that anybody following up can go to that court and retrieve that record to follow it up. So after Ambrose has transferred the title to his names as administrator, it is only him who can execute subsequent transfers to all other possible buyers or even beneficiaries. You cannot get a title transferred from the name of a deceased person to the name of a beneficiary before, or even another person before it is transferred to the names of the administrator. Because for us, you know, we believe once you're dead, you're dead. Dead people tell no tales. You are not going to be able to sign off a transaction. So we shall need your legal representative now who is going to be the administrator to sign off a transaction. And they can only sign off a transaction on a certificate of title if they are the registered proprietors. So that is also a keynote and a take home uh, that once somebody is deceased, the first step to have that land transferred is to register letters of administration. So you will find that uh, many people are stuck with properties, they keep selling, but actually they are not transferring simply because no one has letters of administration. And if a family is not in agreement, those are properties you find over years that the title has never been transferred. The person died and even probably somebody who got letters of administration also forgot to transfer or couldn't transfer because of uh, so many challenges and disagreements in the family. So all that needs to be ironed out as a family. But uh, the law now requires that uh, in cases of transfer of uh, properties for the beneficiaries, it is no longer only the administrators who will sign. Well, as they will sign a transfer instrument or even a mortgage instrument, the person uh, buying this land is now put on further notice and requested to ensure that all beneficiaries named in the application met court. Remember we talked about making an application to court and listing all the beneficiaries. All those beneficiaries are going to be called 
to witness the transaction this administrator is doing. This is another remedy and uh, a step that helps avoid fraud for the beneficiaries in case somebody fraudulently obtained letters of administration for your late father's estate or mother's estate or brother's estate. This is also your time. You can lodge a caveat on that title, but even if you don't lodge a caveat, just know that this uh, administrator is not going to transact anything until they look for you, the beneficiaries, and then you sign off uh, all those instruments as witnesses and agree to the transactions that are being carried out by the administrator. When you remember one of our charts still, we talked about caveats by beneficiaries. So now here, I think it makes more sense as a beneficiary of an estate, you know somebody has obtained letters of administration fraudulently. You can no longer stop them in court because they have been granted. You are still contemplating about filing in court an application to have them revoked or probably you have filed, but you don't have an order yet stopping them. This is when you are going to file what we called the beneficiary's caveat. Now you go caveat that land and that caveat will never lapse. So I hope now it makes more sense when we talk about some of the things that we were talked about earlier in our chat. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. So Council, there is a question here from Ambrose. He says, is it the family that decides the administrator or one can be administrator without even the family of the deceased knowing? And still, if there is no one selected to be administrator, who else can allow an administrator to take charge? Uh, thank you, Ambrose. Uh, on who selects an administrator, I have explained that uh, an administrator is selected by the family. In the family meeting you will hold, you will give consent to one or two or three or four people to say, look, these are going to lead us and they will be the administrators. Unless the family agrees on an administrator, it is quite unfortunate. Uh, nobody else can uh, select an administrator for you. The rare circumstances where an administrator is selected are uh, uh, exceptions. Uh, number one is if we have a case in court and uh, one of the parties dies, but the death of that party does not stop or does not take away the cause of action. I'll give a basic example. We have a land and uh, I and Ambrose are using a land and uh, unfortunately I pass on but because my family is probably situated on that land uh, Ambrose will say no this case does not die it survives uh, the deceased person without somebody died but uh, his people are still here so would like to sue his estate that way we'll make an application to court to force one of my would-be beneficiaries in the estate to be an administrator, but solely for purposes of litigating that case in court. So that is the only exception. The other chance uh, where an administrator may be chosen is when the, attorney, the administrator general himself, the office of the administrator general, seeks to apply to court for grant of letters of administration. However, this practice is uh, no longer, it is on the statute books, but uh, the Administrator General has, in very few occasions, been seen applying to court. He will only come in in those courteous estates where probably interests of many are going to be defeated. But uh, with the involvement of the law and the enlightenment of people, it is very rare for the Administrator General to come in and say, I am going to apply and uh, be the ones to be granted letters of administration. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Uh, just in supplement to that question also, Hubbard has a question here. He says, what is the pro procedure of appointing another administrator in case the one who has been doing that passes on? Uh, thank you, Hubbard. Uh, in case of uh, passing on of an administrator, you go back to court and apply the same court that made that grant. 
to live and be very easy, just produce the, the certificate of that person and go on and apply again. Incidentally, you might find yourself going into the whole procedure again, asking for family minute, I mean, going back to the administrator general. So, uh, however, uh, if there were more than one administrators, you may not have to go back to all that process. You just apply to court and then have that grant revoked and then all the other remaining administrators, if the family members agree, will be kept as the administrators. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Council. Um, when we're getting started on this show, um, I remember you mentioned that the administrator is actually in charge of the deceased's property within and outside Uganda. So would you shed for us some light um, on maybe, is this a legal requirement? But also, what does this mean to the layman, for someone to say, I also have the power to manage someone else's property outside Uganda? And what is involved? Because I can imagine this property is somewhere else in another, um, say, country or boundary, and they have got their own laws. H how does that happen? Uh, thank you very much, Fred. Uh, we have what we call probate sealing and probate resealing. Uh, when we talk of property outside the country, we realize that uh, many jurisdictions now have challenges and uh, we have harmonized. So once you have letters of administration from Uganda, usually from high court, if you intend to administer, or if you know that somebody died but left property outside Uganda, your application should automatically be filed in the high court. Once you have filed in the high court and obtained the letters of administration, you will go to the registrar of that court and then they will, uh, in a special way, certify uh, those letters of administration for use abroad. However, even when you go abroad, you are going to be directed to another court or officer of court who will uh, receive uh, that letters of administration. And then, of course, they will make a background check, uh, do their research, come to Uganda, or through correspondence, send an email, or anyhow, whichever way they may choose to do it, and confirm. Once they have confirmed, they are going to receive your letters of administration, and they will have the effect of as if you were granted in that particular country. The procedure is the same. Once you have received letters of administration from another country, they will be sent to Uganda, you come with them, and then the high court still will look at them, do a verification, then they allow you to go ahead and administer the property. What you, would, you need to take away from here is that you do not need to apply in different countries because the deceased person had properties in different countries. An application in one country could suffice in another country. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Council. I see there is someone else here who has made a call. Um, okay, so someone says, and this is Ambrose, we have a case where the current widow wants to be an administrator without the family's consent. However, the deceased had a wife with whom they had six kids, though four of them also died, meaning it's only two that are alive. How can this lady be put to order? Uh, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I am trying to look at uh, the comments, but uh, my comments are not loading. I would appreciate to read better that question. But uh, I have heard that there is a widow who has uh, who wants to apply for letters of administration. Now, uh, something that you might need to take away from this is that uh, in case of spouses, uh, when we talk of spouses now, we mean people who are legally married. These have a special place and procedure in application for letters of administration. Uh, if 
I am wedded and legally married uh, and I pass on. My wife is entitled to simply walk to court whether or not I leave a will. Please note this. Whether or not I leave a will, my legally wedded or married wife, whichever form of marriage it is, is legally allowed to simply walk into court. It would be like somebody who I left an executor. That's how the law has treated them. So once they run to court, they are going to be granted letters of administration, whether with a will annexed or without a will annexed. So uh, unless that widow is stopped or caveated, she has a right. If she's a widow within the meaning of the law, she has a right to go and apply and she will be granted. However, you can only challenge her if in her application, she is fraudulent and uh, probably conceals some information, does not include some of the children in the application, or does not include some of the property of the deceased person in the application. That is when you are going to challenge your application, and the remedy we give is filing a caveat. Thank you, Council. There is there is something that uh, someone has asked about here in my DM. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't want me to mention their name, but um, they are saying that in a situation where the person has passed on and somewhere, somehow, some of the family members know someone that was holding some documents to some property that belongs to the deceased, but the person holding the documents denies is there a legal action that can be taken against such a person the last bit the last bit you man please i beg your pardon on the last bit somebody is holding a property of the deceased i didn't get yeah uh, so someone pass, passes on but this person is thought to have owned the property whose documents or whose um details are in someone else's hands who is not a family member but when after on death of this person the person holding the documents decides to keep them for themselves so someone is saying is there a legal way this person can be taken to court so that they can now bring the do the documents, the property, the anticipated for the deceased. Yes, 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 yes. That is number one role of the administrator. Upon being granted letters of administration, move out. That's what we talked about. Find out who did these people, who did this deceased person, owe money, or who actually uh, had it for this person. And you have right to sue as an administrator on behalf of, not on behalf of the deceased now, but on behalf of the estate of the deceased person. So once you file your case in court, you can, you can ask for all the remedies you want, but uh, you really have the powers to sue. And the only person who has the powers to sue is the administrator. Beneficiaries have their own rights also to bring an action, but usually it is limited to the estate. If you are suing to recover debts or property or land of a deceased person, you must have letters of administration or letters of profit, and you have to sue in that capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, there are quite some other comments here. Okay, so there is one from uh, Red. They are saying, what if the activities of the administrator require financing to accomplish his administrative duties? Can the administrator then sell or tap into the income of the properties of the deceased in order to finance such activities? Of course, definitely, definitely some of the activities of the administrator, or if not many, will require finances. And that is why at the end of the day, this administrator is going to give what we have termed an accountability to court, and that is the inventory. You are going to tell us how you have distributed and spent all the monies in the estate. So you definitely have to sit with the family and agree and keep them in the know, and they will definitely sanction these costs. But uh, this is where, of course, we have challenges with uh, some of the administrators uh, trying to 
sometimes exaggerate and sometimes of course uh plan and spoil or take over the estate for their own benefit so the moment it is determined that whatever you're doing is not in the interest of the beneficiaries of the estate then that is already a ground for one to file in court for a revocation grant of letters of administration to the administrator Okay, so Musa says, does the will take precedence or the administrator's uh, instructions? Uh, where we have a will, it is automatically the will, as long as that will has not been challenged. If a will was left and it is valid, and you have actually presented it to court and been granted letters of administration, with the will are next. We follow the will. We follow the will. Unless an aspect in that will or the general will has been challenged. But the administrator or executor must go by the detail of the will. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Now, there is one last question here. Actually, I know the last one. Uh, this person says... In case we actually want our the, the widow who was uh, a legal wife to the deceased to be the administrator, but the family wants someone else, what should we do in that case? You see it as a family. Let's embrace dialogue as a family, see it and agree and have reasons. You can have actually two more administrators, uh, not only the widow. If as a family you believe and agree that the widow may not be capable of administering the estate alone, and this is usually in circumstances where we have children from uh, different wives or mothers, and they probably think if it is only one family that is managing, they may not be able to benefit. So usually we have family meetings for such people and uh, advise them to choose one or more two people uh, to be joined in as co-administrators. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this conversation is powered by Amiti Realtors, a real estate agency in Western Uganda. Um, I see last time we had, uh, we wanted to hear from the director of Amity, and we were not able to do that. So I want to give him a minute before I call on council to make his conclusive, uh, concluding remarks. Um, how about I did send you a request to join in. We, I wanted to pose some questions to you, but council before we go, in in the case of say for example the, the the real estate agencies and the deceased had actually owned a property but had not finished paying for it and this person passes on is there any legal requirement for these real estate you know companies to disclose that to the family in case in case maybe the family members did not know that this person was purchasing a piece of land from Amity, is Amity legally required to disclose that to the family? Uh, thank you, Yugaman. Uh, death, as we know it all, uh, usually comes abrupt, uh, save in a few cases where somebody has been uh, bedridden or with terminal illnesses, but... Uh, in case it happens and it is abrupt and uh, you don't know the properties of uh, your spouse, we have had cases where actually some get to know some facts 10 years later. But now this comes with an issue of trust. If you are dealing with a real estate agent, you cannot be sure that uh, tomorrow you are around or they are around. So it goes back to documentation. Where do you document your transactions with Amity? Do you have agreements with Amity? Do you have one single agreement or do you have copies? So uh, for us as lawyers, we have always insisted that uh, any document you make, make it in triplicate, a minimum number of copies. You can make, let them be three. Because if it is between two parties, each of you will keep a copy and you will have an extra copy. So once you have done that, then you know 
that uh, at one time, probably, anybody looking through your documents or your personal belongings will land on this agreement. But what you should avoid is dealing with a real estate agent or a property master or dealer who says that me, I am the only one who's going to remain with a copy of the agreement. You, you don't need it. You have your land. So those you will know that these are probably hiding something that you need to look out for. But also as individuals, let us embrace communication and working together. You cannot keep all your secrets from your close friends. Thank you. If you are not uh, a good confidant with your spouses, we have encouraged you to always embrace uh, using professionals. You have the lawyers. You can always walk into a lawyer's office and be sure that the lawyers don't going to have interest in your property or everybody will know that at least so-and-so is your lawyer. So once you have lost a spouse or a very close friend, always reach out to who they were, who their lawyers were. Some of us surely know secrets of people that uh, their families don't know or even their close friends. So if you reach out to a lawyer and inform them that, look, so-and-so is your good friend, but they're now deceased. Should you be knowing anything, you don't know how much you may uh, recover from such professionals. Fantastic. Um, I think I am done with the questions that were sent to me. Uh, unless someone has a question from the audience, the people that are listening in, Council, what are some of those parting shots that we you want us to take away from this conversation? Uh, thank you, Yugaman, and uh, thank you to all our listeners tonight. Thank you, Amity, for powering this. And uh, one, as we close for today, for me, I will always stress that uh, as individuals, we are of age. If you are 18 years and above, you have a simple property, please make a will. Make a will and appoint an executor in that will. If you don't want to distribute the property, at least appoint an executor and leave the rest. This is going to save you a lot of hassles. We have seen that the process of going to the Advocate General's office is actually a cumbersome process. Many of the disputes we have uh, in estate management today are not actually uh, because of a very serious challenge, but it is only a simple thing of members of one family failing to agree on who to manage the estate. That is usually the challenge. They think, ah, if we appoint this one, we don't trust him. If we appoint this one, we will squander the property. This one has his money, will probably don't give us time. So such things. But if you have a will written down and stipulating everything, you will know that you have reduced 90% chances of your people having dispute over the properties that you are leaving them behind. And then uh, lastly is that uh, please and always engage services of a professional in whatever field you are dealing in. For due diligence, we have always advised that engaged lawyers do not buy an estate property before you have done all the due diligences. I have done some due diligences for Amity and I am sure they are not regretting. And I'm sure if there are any customers of Amity, they know that they have not had challenges with the land that they are buying from Amity because they have gone a step further to do all those due diligences. So thank you very much for listening in and I wish you a blessed night. Thank you very much, Council. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please do go ahead and follow Council Alan and Amity Realtors. Uh, Council, there is someone who has just sent in a comment here, a quick one. Let me just look it up here shortly. Um, okay. 
Okay, all, all right. Someone is just saying um, thank you for for the show and thank you to the team. It's been very, very informative. And that is feedback to you, Council, as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining in. And uh, always thank you for the feedback that you send us. One thing I would want to encourage you is uh, some of you usually join in as we are ending the conversation. But don't worry. These conversations are always recorded and we have them posted on the Amite Realtors YouTube channel. So maybe we will be sharing those links after this so that you can be able to go back and listen to those conversations. Something else that I have found very important in these discussions is, guys, I encourage you to take notes. Take notes or create create some bit of notes out of these discussions. Like what Council today was discussing was actually very, very, very fundamental to the level that we have discussed the wheels, we have discussed caveats, we have discussed what makes a good will, what makes a will bad, and all those requirements. So if somebody has been following the conversation, I am sure today you have greatly, greatly appreciated what Council Allen has explained. But one thing that I also want to remind you is, today you may not be facing something regarding your property or land, but I can assure you somewhere, somewhere how these are things everybody encounters at a certain period of time. So how should you avoid it? Please equip yourself with some bit of knowledge and know where to go in case you such you are in such a scenario. So thank you very much to Amity, the real estate agency in Western Uganda that is always pouring these conversations. And thank you so much to Council Allen and everybody that has asked questions. Please go ahead and let's keep the conversation flowing on the the hashtag Amity Realtors Charts. You can ask your questions and council will be able to answer them. So we'll see you guys again next Tuesday, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Please do keep time and always make sure that you get better, not bitter. Cheers. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.